I hope you can all hear me. Uh, my name is Markus Kra. I'm the executive director of the Leo Beck Institute, and I want to welcome you all to tonight's event by the Leo Beck Institute at the Center for Jewish History, of which we are a proud partner and which is co-sponsoring this event tonight. I'm glad that you all came, um, but I assume we're all less than glad that our topic tonight is sadly still as timely as it is. Um, I'm sure that you have engaged with the topic in various other ways, in reading about it, in attending other events. Um, so I'm glad that you came for this event because we at LBI would like to try something with our program tonight and subsequent programs that hopefully offers a little more historical depth for the current debate than you may get elsewhere. You may know that the Leo Beck Institute is a research archive and library devoted to preserving the history and culture of German-speaking Jews. So for almost 70 years, we have collected a treasure trove of archival material on all kinds of aspects of German Jewish history, not just, but of course, including anti-Semitism and Jewish responses to anti-Semitism. We offer this to researchers, we support scholarship, but we also offer this as a resource to broader audiences who hopefully share our belief that a better understanding of the past will make for a better understanding of the present and maybe for better decisions for the future. So to give you just one example of why I think the historical depth matters for the current debate, in I would assume many of the texts that you have read about the recent wave of anti-Semitism in America you encountered the adjective unprecedented, right? However, about two weeks ago, there was an event in this building by our friends, partner institution, the American Jewish Historical Society, in which the preeminent historian of American Jewish history, Jonathan Sarna, put a question mark to this characterization by pointing to the rampant anti-Semitism in the US in the 1930s. So I think it is worth taking a look into history to better understand and gauge what we experience in the present and how this will shape the future. And I hope that LBI can be helpful in making this connection. So therefore tonight and at the future installments of this series, we will start by introducing you to a historical document from LBI's archive. Our director of collections, Renate Evers, will introduce this topic um, this will be followed by remarks by a historian. Tonight, this will be Garf Rosenfeld, the president of the Center for Jewish History, who I will introduce more properly in a moment, who will place the document in the context of its time. And this will be followed by remarks by a public intellectual, John Gans, who will also be introduced, to connect this to the current debate. And this will be moderated by LBI's director of public history, David Brown, and afterwards, we want to hear from you in a discussion, get your feedback and questions, or will be followed by a reception in the Great Hall where books on the topic will also be on sale. Um, for the Q&A, um, you should all have received note cards um, or will receive note cards, have received note cards, which Stephanie Addis, uh, LBI's uh, programs manager, will collect and then process so that we can um, collect the various questions you may have um, to the panelists. The panelists are Garf Rosenfeld, president of the Center for Jewish History here in New York and professor of history at Fairfield University. His areas of specialization include the history of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust, memory studies, and counterfactual history. And among his many books, the most recent one is a co-edited volume, Fascism in America, Past and Present, which came out last year. John Gans writes the widely acclaimed, rightly so, unpopular front newsletter for Substack. His work has appeared in the Washington Post, Art Forum, The New Statesman, and other publications. And his first book, When the Clock Broke, Conmen, Conspiracists, and How America Cracked Up in the Early 1990s, which came out recently to great acclaim, is a political history of the United States in the 1990s. 
this is, as I mentioned, the start of a three-part series um, on the history of anti-Semitism and its relevance for our current debate. The next event will be a week from today, October 29th, and another one on, the, on November 3rd. You have that information on the flyer, which I hope you all took. Um, I want to gratefully acknowledge that this program is supported in part by a grant from the Erna and Heinz Meyer Fund at the LBI, which was set up by LBI trustee Charles Hestorfer in the name of his grandparents. Thank you very much. Tonight's program, as you saw, is entitled Anti-Semitism as a Pillar of Fascism, and it will use Adolf Hitler's 1923 Beer Putsch as one starting point of a discussion whether fascism is a useful category not just for movements in the past, but also for the current debate. So I invite Renate to come up to take us back some hundred years before we work our way back to the present. Thank you all for coming, and I hope we'll have a great discussion. Thank you. Okay, good evening. So how is the audio? It's okay. <laughs> okay, I will give you a brief visual introduction into the historical context of fall 1923 in Munich and Bavaria, which culminated in Hitler's failed 1923 insurrection, the so-called Beer Hall Putsch in Munich in November 1923. What is lesser known is the widespread state and mob violence against Jews in Munich prior to the Putsch, and which continued. It foreshadowed the vicious anti-Semitic violence during the Nazi regime a decade later. Fall 1923, Munich. Here is the front page of the Zionist Bavarian newspaper, Das Jüdische Echo, the Jewish Echo, from late November 23. The shocking headline translates to the expulsion of the Jews from Munich. The newspaper reported retrospectively about the expulsions of about 250 non-naturalized Polish and Austrian Jewish families in October 23. And this happened a few weeks before Hitler's putsch in November. The main article is titled, The Tidal Wave of Hatred, Die Sturmflut des Hasses. There's also a euphemistic note why this was published late and retrospectively. It says, Is issues 43 to 47 were not published under the pressure of the political circumstances. The article states, quote, we Jews endured days of terror that even in the context of anti-Semitic propaganda would have seemed unimaginable in a central European state until recently, end of quote. The article also details the terror and increasingly physical violence in Munich and Bavaria prior to the expulsion, such as abuse of the rabbi at a Nazi gathering, which refers to the Munich rabbi Leo Berwald, who was beaten up when he protested at a Nazi rally, several violent disruptions of meetings. There had also been attacks on Jewish homes during Sukkot in September 23, an assault on commercial Councillor Sigmund Frankel, the chairman of the Orthodox Synagogue. Other incidences were a pogrom in the Bavarian town of Memming in 23, as well as threats that led to the cancellation of the premiere of the movie Nathan the Wise in early 23. The events culminated in the expulsion of Jewish families from Munich. Quote, one outcome of the anti-Semitic propaganda was a campaign to expel Jews which started around mid-October. Approximately 200 to 250 families were singled out as the first victims. The article observes, quote, a term co consistently used in the expulsion process is economic parasite. So the German term was, that was used is wirtschaftlicher Schädling. The expulsion had specifically targeted Eastern European Jewish families who had fled pogroms um, at the end of the 19th century after World War I or during, uh, over hired as workers in World, during World War I, but did not obtain citizenship. So quote, 
since October 16, when a large number of Eastern Jewish families were subjected to house searches early in the morning, the approximately 250 Eastern Jewish families in Munich have been living in constant anxiety. It continues, the expulsion is not due to any personal wrongdoings, rather it seeks out any reason, however minor and however long ago, in the past lives of those being expelled. Then the, um, the issue lists dozens of cases with the usually far-fetched reasons for the expulsion order. So one example is, um, moment, I have to get this a little bit down. DE has lived in Munich for 18 years, is married and has five children born in Munich. Reasons for expulsion, police complaints due to speculation with foreign currencies and price inflation. Both offenses were purely formal and involved offering dollar prices and purchase advertisements for first without explicitly stating that these were dollar conversions. E has lived in Germany since he was seven years old. So end of quote. The Jüdische Echo also reported about international protest against the expulsion of Jewish families in Munich. For example, Poland considered to retaliate with the expulsion of families with Bavarian roots from Poland, which indeed happened later. Holland saw protest rallies, and in the US, Rabbi Stephen Weiss had sent a protest um, on behalf of the US Congress to the American government. The American Jewish News Agency, JTA, Jewish Telegraphic Agency, had already reported on October 29, 1923, about the expulsion, stating Jews deported from Bavaria by hundreds. These deportations were not entirely unexpected. They were part of a conspiracy between the Bavarian State Commissioner Gustav von Kahr and Adolf Hitler. As early as October 8th, JTA had already warned of an impending expulsion plot. So the quote, Adolf Hitler, fascisti and anti-Semite leader, has presented to von Kahr the conditions on which he will cooperate with the Bavarian dictator. Relative to the Jews, Hitler demands as a sine qua non for cooperation, so essential for cooperation, that all Jews who immigrated into Bavaria after 1914 be expelled and all their property be confiscated. So a little bit background on Gustav von Kahr. Um, he was an ultra conservative right wing Bavarian politician and lawyer who had been granted dictatorial powers in September 1923 during a period of political violence in Weimar Republic, Germany. He had briefly served as Bavarian prime minister following the instability after the Bavarian November Revolution in 1919, which had been followed by a brief period of two Soviet-style council governments. He aimed to create a conservative cell of order in Bavaria. Kahr opposed the Weimar Republic and plotted to overthrow the government in Berlin. Inspired by Mussolini's March on Rome, in this 1921 photo, von Kahr is seen with other key ultra-reactionary um, right-wing figures in Munich. In the middle, World War I um, General Erich von Ludendorff, who had promoted the step in the Beckmuth and participated in the failed 1920 Kaputsch in Berlin. On the right, Munich's police chief, Ernst Pöhner, known for his anti-Semitism. Adolf Hitler, an ambitious newcomer in these circles, had settled in Munich after World War I and founded the NSDAP, the Nazi party, attracting increasing public support. He sought the backing of Ludendorff and Pöhner to join the, coup, um, the putsch plans of Gustav von Kahr. But von Kahr aimed to establish a nationalist dicta dictatorship without Hitler. Before Gustav von Kahr could take action, Hitler initiated the Beer Hall Putsch in November, causing Ludendorff and Pöhner to shift their loyalty and allegiance to him. Hitler, with Pöhner set to become Bavaria's minister president if the coup succeeded. And with this, we are in um, um, November 8th and 9th. Hitler's insurrection took place on these dates in Munich. It was called the Beer Hall Putsch because since it started in a large beer hall, so as a point of reference. Beer halls were important sites for political gatherings in Munich, including for the Nazi party. Here is a photo from a Nazi event in the early 1920s. Similarly, on November 8, 1923, 
So um, aforementioned State Commissioner Gustav von Kahr addressed a large crowd in the same venue, the Bürger Breukeller. Seizing the moment, Hitler entered with his um, paramilitary troops, his stormtroopers, surrounded the hall, set up a machine gun, and fired a shot into the ceiling. He and his associates, Hermann Göring and Rudolf Hess, held Gustav von Kahr at gunpoint, declared the Bavarian government overthrown, and announced a new government with Ludendorff. The day after these nightly events, on November 9th, the Nazi newspaper, Der Völkische Beobachter, already proclaimed victory, announcing a German national government in Munich, Hitler and Ludendorff take over the national dictatorship. But things were not so clear yet. The morning of November 9th, about 2,000 Nazis led by General, General Erich von Ludendorff marched to the Feldernhalle in Munich. Um, here are more, more photos. Many of you probably are very familiar with them from that day, showing armed paramilitary men disembarking from a truck. And here is a similar street scene and um, a large crowd gathered in front of the Munich City Hall to hear Nazi orator, orator Julius Streicher. However, sections of the Bavarian leadership, military police, church, including the Bavarian prince, did not support the coup and sent police who clashed with the insurrectionist. 16 people were killed and many injured. Hitler's 1923 putsch had failed. Hitler fled, but was captured two days later. And public support for the coup d'etat quickly faded. Hitler, here on a photo um, during his trial, Hitler and his co-conspirators, including um, the aforementioned General Ludendorff, were tried for high treason. Some of his fellow conspirators, including Hermann Göring, escaped to Austria. Um, Ludendorff was acquitted due to Ludendorff's war service and connections, along with the claim that he was only present during the putsch by accident. Um, Hitler was sen sentenced to five years in Festungshaft, fortress confinement. In the end, Hitler served just over eight months of the sentence before his early release for good behavior. Um, here's the interior view of the cell occupied by Adolf Hitler following the failed beer hall putsch, set up later as a shrine by the Nazis. Festungshaft was the mildest type of jail sentence available in German law at the time. It excluded forced labor, provided reasonably comfortable cells, and allowed the prisoner to receive visitors. Um, while imprisoned during his sabbatical in Landsberg, Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. The book was part autobiography and part public treatise, a political treatise. Mein Kampf promoted the key components of Nazism, fanatical anti-Semitism, a racist worldview, and an aggressive foreign po policy geared towards gaining Lebensraum living space in Eastern Europe. Also, Hitler did not achieve his immediate goal of overthrowing the Bavarian government and then the government of the Weimar Republic in Berlin. The Bierhall Putsch gave the Nazis their first national attention and a significant propaganda victory. The experience shifted Hitler's view on using violence um, for political change. From then on, he aimed to pursue his goals through mainly legal means. And after his release in 1925, he resumed leadership of the Nazi party. Nevertheless, the terror against the Jewish population continued. The Jüdische Echo, for example, reported about continued targeted expulsion here in Nuremberg in December 23, and 10 um, families were um, um, the target of those expulsions. The events in Munich are analyzed in detail by the historian Michael Brenner in his recently published book in Hitler's Munich, Jews, the Revolution and the Rise of Nazism. Um, if, um, published 22. Uh, it's a translation of Der Lange Schatten der Revolution. In the words of one of his reviewer, reviewers, historian John Efron, quote, it shows the fragility of democracies, the consequences of unchecked anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, and the willingness of self-serving political 
elites to aid and abet the rise to power of populist demagogues, end of quote. With this broad context and overview of the pivotal events of 1923 in Munich and Bavaria, I now turn the um, talks and discussion over to Gerf Rosenfeld and John Gens, um, who will explore the connection between anti-Semitism and fascist movements then and now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Renata. Um, thank you for that um, introduction. And um, my name is David Brown. I'm director of public history uh, at Leo Beck Institute. It's an honor to uh, moderate this discussion between John Gantz and Gabriel Rosenfeld. And we're going to talk about uh, anti-Semitism. We're going to talk about fascism. Um, uh, but first, uh, I want to kind of stick with this history and, and ask, throw the first question to you, Gav, as a, um, of course, you've written a lot lately about fascism in America, but you're a German historian by training and, and um, much of your work. So we've just heard about an attack on Bavarian Jews in the Weimar Republic, um, who, according to one of those JTA articles that we uh, read while we were, we were working on this, they feared pogroms like never before in the history of Germany. But the Nazis are not in power. They, um, their, their putsch fails. Um, can you explain what's going on politically in Munich at this time? Yeah, of course. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. John, it's great to be with you. David, Marcus, everyone who, and Renata, of course, thank you for all your remarks. Um, so backstory, I lived in Munich for two years, uh, the first year in 1989-90 when the Berlin Wall collapsed and I thought I had gotten my Fulbright in the wrong city, but it turned out I was actually in the right city because it launched me on a multi-year immersion in the history of Munich. I was there also in 93-94 at a time when the city was really uh, delving into its Nazi past for the first time. Um, some of you probably know um, that Munich had two honorific titles during the Nazi regime. Uh, the capital of the um, Hauptstadt Bewegung, the capital of the movement, the Nazi movement, also the capital of German art. So um, in the 90s, the people of Munich were really wrestling with that legacy. What did it mean? Uh, certainly a couple of years after German unification. Um, and you know, how could they live that legacy down or, or wrestle with it and figure out um, the best way forward? Um, as a result, I uh, wrote my first book about Munich. Um, and have always been fascinated why it was the place where the Nazi movement took root. And I just want to say a couple of things about the context for um, the 1923 deportation order, not only because it should help us understand that that um, very discriminatory edict was not a function of the Nazis, but a function of the reactionary climate more broadly in Bavaria, uh, and then also what that might have to say about um, present day debates uh, about immigration. Um, so to basically set the stage, and, and Renata had alluded to this already, um, in 1918, uh, what you find happening in Bavaria and in Munich particularly is the collapse of a very, very long-standing uh, conservative order. The Wittelsbach monarchy had been in existence for 800 years. It's overthrown uh, in the November 7th, 1918 revolution, which was led by Kurt Eisner, and mostly people from the USPD, a little bit more left-wing version of the Social Democratic Party, which by then was a very mainstream parliamentary uh, party. Eisner, of course, was a Jewish journalist, uh, originated in Berlin, came down into um, Bavaria earlier um, in sort of anticipation of some of the events that might be taking place later. Um, tragically for him, while he ended up overthrowing the monarchy, um, partly in revulsion uh, with the masses of people in Munich against the, the lost war and the catastrophic decision-making of the Prussian monarchy in, in Berlin, um, he paid uh, for his activism with his life because he was assassinated in early 1919. Um, I'm getting to the point, I suppose, where I want to make it clear that Bavaria does undergo a lot of objectively traumatic events that will help explain why it becomes a reactionary bastion, uh, the most reactionary state in all of Germany after 1918. Um, but uh, it's not bad enough that there's a revolution that deposes the monarchy in November of 1918. There's also two Soviet republics that are um, basically created as the result of communist revolutions in April of 1919, 
And if you pull that all together, what you find is that in May of 1919, um, the Fry Corps, white reactionary paramilitary troops are sent into the city. Several hundred people are killed in urban uh, street fighting. And with the demise of communism and with the association of communism with many Jewish revolutionaries who had been part of these events ever since the fall of 1918, what you find is a perfect storm of resentment, uh, reactionism, uh, and other sorts of right-wing sentiment taking root in Bavaria. Um, people oftentimes say that Bavaria is sort of the Texas of Germany in the sense that it has a long separatist streak. Uh, it's primarily, or at least historically, was very agricultural, not very urban. You know, it was not a bastion of liberalism, unlike, say, uh, Berlin. And that climate only goes further to the right after um, 1918, um, after the left-wing revolutions. And to just put a you know, fine point on it, um, this is the climate out of which the Nazis emerge in the spring of 1920. But by far and away, they're not the only right-wing extremist organization on the scene. There are many, many others. But when you look at the fact that in the 1924 elections, uh, the Reichstag elections in Germany, um, the block of parties that the Nazis are a part of, they only get 6% of the vote nationally. The Nazi party is actually banned in 1924, but they're still fielding candidates as part of a Folkish block. They get 6% of, of the vote nationally. They get 28% of the vote in Munich. So Munich was a place from 1918 to 1930 that was very much supportive of right-wing reactionary policies. And Gustav von Kahr, who Renata mentioned, is the one who comes up with this idea of deporting uh, Eastern European Jews uh, from the city. Um, he's doing that merely to try and outflank the Nazis. Um, he's trying to take some of their talking points and make them his own. But it also turns out that the crown prince uh, in Bavaria at the time, Ruprecht von Bayern, he also is supportive of this. There was not one political party in Munich uh, that didn't support these expulsions except for the socialists, the SPD. So I'll just end there and to point out that one didn't have to be a Nazi to be a right-wing reactionary to support the expulsion of immigrants. Uh, and that, I think, certainly um, bears repeating when we think about who in this country today is advocating for mass deportations to the tune of maybe 30 million. So uh, let's pick up on that. Um, you know, the, the line from that right-wing government in Munich in 1923 was that um, they, these people were persecuted and deported as Jews. I mean, we know that that was part of the motivation, but they were described explicitly as, as foreigners and, you know, in a legal sense they were, and also as economic parasites. Um, and John, in your, um, in your book that just came out, um, you track a lot of similar rhetoric coming from the right, um, but also in your writing about um, in the 1990s, but also in your writing about contemporary politics. Um, and I wonder if you can comment on how useful you think Weimar history is for, um, for understanding that kind of rhetoric in, um, in, more recent, in a more recent American context, particularly when um, you know, arguably we don't have the level of sort of social dislocation and disorder, the traumatic events that uh, God was referring to in the history of the Weimar Republic and the post-World War I era. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, once again, thank you for having me. Thanks to the Center for Jewish History and the Leo Back Institute. Yeah, I think one thing to think about historical analogies is that they're always wrong. Um, there is no exact period of history that is like any other. The conditions will be extremely difficult. Um, so it's just an important thing to keep in mind. I, although I think fascism is an appropriate context to talk about the American right, I often avoid Weimar Germany because of the extremity of the social conditions, um, because of the extremity of the particular fascist movement that came out of it, National Socialism, and because of the emotional response that people have to that, understandably have to that history, which can often lead to kind of caricatured or uh, cartoonish visions of, of what fascism means. Um, and part of that is shaped by fascist propaganda itself. Um, I do think, however, like many others uh, who have seen the direction of the American right in the last decade or so, there are unavoidable parallels. Um, and when you look at specific histories like this one and you see the targeting, not necessarily first of old established populations of, 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 of Jews, but of, you know, of people who could be targeted as, as recent arrivals, as an economic drag, uh, 
um, as you know, less civilized and developed being from the East. Um, the, it, it's, it's very difficult not to, to, to want to make these parallels, um, especially now when we're, we're you know, looking at very virulent um, anti-immigration rhetoric and attacks on, on, on migrants. I think that the, I would have hesitated until recently to go there, but I think in the past few months, I even have been shocked by the by the degree of of, of rhetorical you know uh, uh, rhetorical vehemence about it, and then there's the conspiratorial aspect, which is always present in anti-Semitism, which is that you know not only are these people a, a drag or an economy or they're they're aliens in some way, they are they are up to something. They are they are actively um, you know sapping the strength of the nation. And you begin to see this sort of rhetoric, perhaps uh, not explicitly about Jews, but maybe with kind of shape, shapes and shadows of anti-Semitism um, in recent rhetoric from about internal enemies uh, and this vast imaginary about you know the nation being destroyed, uh, internally poisoned by by migrants and these internal political enemies. I think one thing to remember is that. You know, politics happens in the imagination too. And the objective conditions of the United States today do not approach anything as dire as the revolutionary situations in the Weimar Republic. But in the imaginations and the rhetoric that were presented, they do. You know, the, the, the United States is presented as being in an extraordinary situation of crisis. Um, and certain people are put to blame for that. Gov, do you want, want to respond to that? I mean, it's, I, I was struck when you said, John, and I totally agree that, um, almost totally agree, that okay. historical analogies are always wrong. I mean, <laughs> I would definitely agree that they're always used, and more often than not, they're um, off base somehow. Yeah. Um, what, you know, I'll anticipate a couple of things I was going to say in a second, anyway, to, to your next question, David, <laughs> but as we segue, um, like so many other German historians who spent their careers starting in the late, 80s, early 90s, wor worrying about the Germans being recidivists and going back to their old bad habits from the first half of the 20th century, uh, and always sort of keeping or monitoring the Germans, making sure they're on probation so they didn't do it again. Um, it was jarring in 2015 when we were much more confident about German democracy being sort of reliable than our own democracy. And so many colleagues of mine, who I see every year at the German Studies Association uh, conference, um, you know, have since been moving into the study of American history to try and figure out, can the German past teach us anything about the American present? And what I've learned about historical analogies is, yes, they're more often than not um, unreliable, but they always ping pong back and forth between two extremes, either overestimating the similarities between today and yesterday or underestimating the similarities. And what that ends up doing emotionally or psychologically is breeding a sense of alarmism mm -hmm. among people that, oh my God, here we are on the precipice of you know, January 1933, uh, or we're complacent. You know, Nothing yeah. new under the sun. Trump is just another sign of American conservatism. Right. And we don't have to you know, be afraid of um, you know, the idea that this time it might be different, because right. there is always a first time for things to be different. Yeah, I, I to I, th that assessment, I, I, I totally agree with. I think that the, the the thing to avoid is caricatures that would lead people to be alarmist or just to dismiss the analogy. I think also histories like this are important. As you're pointing out, it wasn't that the Nazis were the only game in town. They were part of a whole matrix of reactionary politics, which they were affecting and moving. It wasn't a given that the Nazis would seize power uh, in 1933, I don't think. Um, however, they were already enough of a political force to affect things like this. So when you see things happen in the United States where um, extreme groups or extreme factions of parties uh, perhaps don't have giant constituencies yet or are not in power, but they still have an effect on the political field. They, 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 they have power in the sense that they can you know, create rhetoric or create policies or, or shape policies. So I think what's interesting, what I encourage people to look at when they look at these histories is don't view it only as the story of, oh, well, here's a movement that's an inevitable juggernaut that will seize power. No, not necessarily. It, many contingencies happen. They can be turned back. 
In the process, however, in the, that, that, that politics unfolds, they can do an enormous amount of horrible things and you know, years later you could say, oh well, they didn't go all the way, but still, you know, they were able to accomplish X, Y, and Z, terrible policy or, or, or degradation of the, of the political discourse. Yeah, yeah. and in, in, in comparison, I mean, you know, we'll see what happens in a couple of weeks, but when anyone studies the years 1918 and 1923 in Germany, in the most charitable interpretation, one would be able to conclude very easily that the German people were objectively you know, traumatized given a lost war, given the reparations you know, of the Treaty of Versailles, given the hundreds of thousands of civilian deaths during the War of Starvation in 1917, not to mention multiple left-wing revolutions and then right-wing counter-revolutions and political violence and assassinations and hyperinflation. It goes on and on. What excuse do we have? Yeah. to like flirt with some similar form of, if not identical, but right-wing um, excess. And we've got 4% unemployment last time anyone checked. You know, I mean, obviously there's issues with inflation and COVID and so forth, but you know, it, by way of comparison, I think we deserve much less of a pass. Not that the German people should have gotten a pass for what happened, but you, you get my point. There's a certain, and I wonder, John, just out of curiosity, how people will look back on it in 20 years, was this, you know, this rhetoric that's leading so many people to believe that we're under siege and that there's a great replacement taking place and all these things in a climate of relative economic stability. I mean, God knows what would it be like if we were actually living in a world where it was 12 to 15% unemployment and people had more material objective reasons to be lunatics. Well, yes, I think, you know, if you look at the, at the statistics, it's difficult to understand sometimes why people would perceive the country to be in an extraordinarily difficult position. But the changes that have happened in the United States in the last 30 or 40 years are, are massive. Uh, demographic, demographics have changed. The country is a lot less white than it used to be. There's a different, you know, uh, our industrial system has changed radically. The same kinds of jobs are not, uh, you know, available. The same kinds of expectations are not available. Um, our position vis-a-vis -vis the world is more anxious than it was before. Maybe not in the same sense that it was with Hitler's paranoia of German, Germany being overtaken by other countries in the world, but you definitely hear this in you know, Trump's rhetoric that other countries are gonna beat us out. Mm -hmm. um, and we lived through some pretty severe, I mean, we, we kind of have a, uh, our memories kind of avoid these things, but we lived through some pretty severe social crises in the past decade. We had, um, COVID, which revealed incredible cultural fault lines in the country about something you would think you know, could be objectively, scientifically discussed. And then we had the mass protests, George Floyd, and the reaction to that, which were the biggest protest movements in American history by some estimations. Um, obviously, not quite on the level of the, 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 the Soviets and the, and the council communist revolts in Germany in terms of the violence and the old social order being uprooted or threatened to be uprooted, but you know, significant uh, social crises that in the uh, rhetoric and the imaginary of, of the far right, which are things that they have a story about, uh, and they feel like the best uh, solution to. Yeah. So I, I just want to respond to two things in that, um, in what you've both been saying, and then, and then move on to the fascism debate. Sure. Um, but so first, it's just to plug, uh, John, your book. Oh, if, uh, I mean, if you're interested in particularly in, you know, sort of the political fallout of economic uh, dislocations in the last 30 years, I think it's a really interesting um, look at that. And also, you know, as someone who lived through that as a young person is like going back and looking at like all, all, those, all those things, um, you know, Rodney King, um, all these things that was sort of like, I was a young person, it's yeah. like, well, this is normal life, but it's like, think about my child seeing things like that and think, you know, like, I want to protect them from that. Right. So, and then the other thing I just wanted to say is what you said about politics happening in the imaginary. Um, it reminds me of something that you wrote, um, I think, a, kind of in <laughs> one of your pieces on the fascism debate about um, the level of organization required for Nazis to take power yeah. and how the context is different in, in, due, to our, due to social media, yeah. um, kind of like the communications environment. And I think that's also sort of, that changes people's minds Absolutely. and 
uh, it's an, an interesting way to look at what's, what's making people crazy now uh, despite relative prosperity. Um, Although it, I think it also bears repeating that <clears throat> we were talking earlier in the green room about the 90s, and we could make the same argument about the late 60s, where when you really think about you know, three major political assassinations in that decade, two in, in 68, when you think about the fact that, yes, there was a forever war going on, but it was directly impacting American right, there was a draft. kids who were being drafted and, and were, you know, dying in Vietnam. When you think about, and when you think about the 90s, how it was the first Iraq war, we've got the LA riots that I was, you know, that I experienced in um, Los Angeles as a graduate student, there were no, there was no shortage of the same material crises that we could point to, but we didn't see what we see now, which is the political system, at least in the Republican form, the Republican Party, exploiting those things for their own political gain. Because in the '60s, Nixon, you know, clearly co-opted the, the far right George Wallace. I mean, he ran to the right. But then the Republican Party, when Nixon got caught in Watergate, threw him under the bus. That's in, inconceivable today. Yeah. And by the same token, Bob Dole in 96, when he ran against Clinton, you know, completely was a mainstream, legitimate kind of candidate, even though Newt Gingrich two years earlier, you already see the seeds of Trumpism in him. So I guess my question is, uh -huh. where's the root of the dysfunction today? Because objectively, we're better off in terms of material crises compared to the late 60s or even the early 90s, well, or at least no worse? I think the, the late 60s, obviously there's an enormous amount of political unrest, but both parties are seen by the public as just alternate, you know, as fairly conservative defenders of social order. Uh, Nixon seems to be, you know, the person that can bring back the promise of the 1950s a little bit more. Uh, yes, he does co-opt part of Wallace's, uh, Wallace's um, movement and his, and his rhetoric, but you know, he had been thought of by the conservative movement as a moderate and a pragmatist, not someone they particularly liked. In the early 1990s, you do see very clearly the roots of the types of pol politics that Trump practices because you have, first of all, David Duke in Louisiana runs, and he runs a credible campaign to, to become governor of Louisiana, he gets a national stage for himself. Um, he's a former wizard of the KKK and a neo-Nazi. Uh, Pat Buchanan takes his message, his rhetoric. Um, he had already shared many of the same beliefs, but saw it as a signal, a moment, that his type of politics had some purchase and basically ran a kind of Gene McCarthy protest candidacy against George H.W. Bush and, and, and arguably, you know, fatally wounded his, his candidacy and knocked him out and showed that there was some some salience to those types of politics. So you see, and then you have Ross Perot, who without some of the same, uh, or, or, or it's more coded or hidden or not as important, the same kind of racial animus, um, the same kind of um, dissatisfaction with the political establishment as being uh, incompetent and unable to handle the, uh, the current set of crises, which is something you absolutely see as part of, I think, a fascist politics, which is not just, it's just the existing political establishment, this is the popular side of fascism, is corrupt and useless uh, and, and needs to be kicked out. So you have the ingredients of it, uh, they don't get all put together until later. But it's important to point out, when do they start to get put together? Well, after the worst financial crisis and economic stress since the Great Depression. Uh, this is when the Tea Party emerges and Trump is a creature of the Tea Party. So I think you can begin to kind of put this genealogy together. Yeah, I think, so, and, and just to add maybe, I think the fact is is that all the Republic, the mainstream GOP leaders who were able to keep that populism or nativism in check, yeah. that finally breaks down in 2016 when I, Trump runs as an outsider, embracing those people who had always been kept at arm's length. Yeah. And then that's when you get making, you know, him making fun of Jeb Bush and all the other 15 candidates or basically laughed off the stage, and it seems to me that maybe is the time when you see sort of the mainstream, well, the, the mainstream Republican leadership completely collapsing. Yeah. An outsider takes over the party, and basically just jumps into bed with that whole constituency, which yes, in, in, in Pat Buchanan, in George Wallace, in Barry Goldwater, you go all the way back to the isolationists of the 30s. Yeah. That's, they've always been waiting for their moment, and Trump gives it to them. Well, and, and they are, insofar as they've had articulate you know, ideological voices, they've always said, look, we are the actual core of, of this movement and party, 
which is being ignored and uh, and managed, and eventually we're going to have enough mm -hmm. and break through. And, which is, by the way, as a kid, I don't know, David, if you felt this way, why I was so grateful that Bill Clinton had his eight-year run and kept those people up there. I don't know if you deal with any counterfactual history, but if Clinton doesn't get 42% of the vote and still become president in 92, or whatever, 43%, yeah. um, you can imagine some kind of a much more right-wing regime leading the country down a much more perilous path. Being, in, being mindful of all the, terrible, all the problems of Bill Clinton's presidency, I remember feeling grateful at the time, like, wow, we kind of dodged a bullet. <laughs> by getting the Democrats to be in charge for the next eight years mm -hmm. and having a balanced budget at the end of the decade and whatever other problems we could certainly itemize of Clinton's. Well, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, rather than get into the halcyon days of the Clinton presidency, let's, uh, let's get, we, we were back at fascism. Yeah. And I think, uh, John, I'm just going to ask you, the fascism debate. Yeah. What is it? Uh, what's your position? And then, most importantly, I think if you can focus in your answer on, like, what do you think the political stakes are for people who are concerned about fascism? How should they organize differently? How should they defend themselves? What you know? Um, uh, yeah. So, fascism debate. Your position and kind of what does it mean politically? Well. Ever since, pretty much ever since Trump appeared as a national political figure, there's been people raising the specter of fascism. And it occurred to me early on that it, in his rhetoric and in the shape of his movement, the way it attacked the conservative movement in the Republican Party from kind of outside or from its right, um, and in some ways from its left, uh, I thought it was an interesting analogy. Um, there is a, I'm going to try to reconstruct the arguments of my opponents in this as generously as I can, but I may say other things that are less generous. Um, basically, there's another group of people who believe that the analogy is just kind of fatuous on the face of it, that Trump is too much of a clown to, to take that seriously. Then there's a kind of strategic argument on the left which says, well, this is kind of a blackmail of liberals to convince uh, those on the more radical left that Trump is some unique threat, so we need to form a popular front and just go and vote blue no matter who, uh, and not advocate for our own, uh, you know, more left-leaning politics. I don't understand that at all, personally, because my understanding of the successful de democracies who defeated fascism, um, you know, for a time, France and the United States, basically put together you know, broad social democratic coalition that included, you know, everybody from the center to the far left. Um, so I don't personally understand the the argument that um, th that somehow it's a def and those are you know those saw giant social transformations in both those countries, um, and you know we still have elements of the New Deal order in France. Some things in the Popular Front reverse, but you know that's where they got the forty hour week and. And 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 vaca paid vacations. So I think that anti-fascism goes hand in hand with 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 the social democratic politics. Um, but and then I think there's another aspect, which is not something these people would necessarily cop to. But this is my own sociology or psychoanalysis of them, if you want. Is that labeling things fascist um, is is not traditionally thought to be the business of serious intellectuals. It's, it's a lowbrow, pamphleteer's term of abuse. So I think that many people consider themselves um, to be smart and to be extremely knowledgeable about the history of politics uh, kind of shrink from that as being a little bit, um, let's say, uh, it's not appropriate to, to, to use. And we, we should use more sophisticated terminology and sophisticated understandings of things. My my argument is well if the shoe at some point you know things begin to approach what it really looks like I don't think as I said I don't think historical analogies are entirely correct I do think that as far as you know a theory of what Trumpism is some analogy with fascism seems to be the one that theory that kind of has predictive validity right so what did uh, um, advocates of the fascism thesis say would happen under Trump, right? Well, 
he might attempt some kind of extra legal coup-like move on power with the help of some paramilitary street fighting organizations. And people who are opponents of the fascism argument said that's absurd, there's not gonna be any kind of violence after the election. And people who were in favor of the fascism said, no, I think he, he might actually try something like that. Well, he did. So I would say, I thought at that point, we had won the argument, there would be nothing left. And I said, oh yeah, that's, that's it. You, you, at least there's some validity to this. But then the goalpost shifted and it said, well, that wasn't really all that serious. But as we see from the history we're talking about now, there are failed attempts, um, you know, not to say it'll eventually become successful, they could just fail forever. I mean, the, 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 the fascist coup attempt that happened in, in France in 1934 was, was a failure. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the, it's not an argument to say, well, it's not particularly powerful or serious or successful, so that's why we can't call it fascism. I just think fascism is obviously if not exactly what we're looking at, at least the context, and an important context to understand the way this for type of politics can develop. And I think it has some predictive validity, as I said. Yeah, so, Gav, mm -hmm. um, has anyone who's read your book, Fascism in America, um, Which knows? Which yeah. um, <laughs> It's great. Uh, yeah, I didn't, yeah. didn't mean to imply <laughs> <Yeah>. otherwise. <laughs> but, <laughs> Just an opportunity to point out that um, we actually have that book for sale uh, afterwards, um, and you have convened uh, a dozen or so scholars who uh, do take it seriously as a category for uh, intellectual and historical analysis. Um, but you know, you read the book; you, it's about things that happened since the 1920s in the United States, um, and I wonder if you, you can talk about how uh, useful the category is, um, you know, not just in its European context um, or with groups that understood themselves explicitly as fascist, um, but in looking at a whole variety of uh, social and political movements, including in the United States. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and just to pick up on both what you just asked and what John was just talking about, um, my current book project is called A Century of American Fascism, and it looks at the whole fascism debate literally since 1922. <clears throat> and one thing that becomes very clear is that the question of, is there such a thing as American fascism? If so, what are its origins? And if we can identify its origins, how serious a threat is it? That has been debated literally since Herbert Hoover. Um, every single president of the United States since Herbert Hoover has been called a fascist. <laughs> sometimes it's leftist calling conservative Republicans fascist, sometimes it's the other way around. Um, but it's been a ubiquitous slur, and at the level of rhetoric, what John said is absolutely true. It is an easy go-to um, term of opprobrium that is used all the time in all aspects of the print media, television, radio, and now, of course, on social media. And of course, in the context of the Gaza war, uh, you find it in uh, spades as well. Um, but it makes it very hard at the analytical level to move beyond the purely rhetorical level of what has been talked about for a century to figure out, is there any there there? So you know, the subtitle of the book that I'm flirting with now is you know, A Century of American Fashions Between Rhetoric and Reality. Because one would like to believe that there is some way of analytically, empirically showing that there is some fascist essence somewhere at a time when everyone's saying it's everywhere but it makes you realize that that's the famous, you know, um, boy crying wolf, or girl crying wolf, or whoever's crying wolf, um, parable at, at work. Because if people have been crying about the onset or the approach of American fascism for 100 years, and it's never happened, at least in terms of seizing power and imposing a fascist regime, well, at a certain point, people are gonna be very skeptical. Um, and so instead of the category of fascism, a lot of historians have used the concept of nativism which dates back really to the 1840s in America, or they'll use the phrase populism, dating back more to the 1890s. Or they might use you know, just the old tried and true term of conservatism, and they might make the case that Donald Trump, and this is what a lot of leftist observers would say, is no different from Barry Goldwater, and if he wasn't a fascist, well, how can Trump be a fascist? So I guess one of the points that I could also get into more detail about, but I'll cut it short here, is that these analogies, these comparisons are inherently and invariably political. Mm -hmm. And if you actually look at 100 years from the 30,000 foot perspective, you'll find four recurring <coughs> positions by um, four very distinct groups in American life. Liberals, conservatives, um, liberals, conservative Marxists, and African Americans. 
And depending on what error it is, they may be in sync with each other or separating from one another. Uh, and the um, conclusions are oftentimes very severe and very critical and pessimistic. Other times they're more dismissive and Pollyannish. But those four perspectives have been in constant um, dialogue with one another, really since FDR's administration. And so what we're seeing today is, in, since 2015, is certainly a continuation of that. But I'm certainly of the opinion that we're much closer to a reality being born that could qualify for this category than, than ever before for reasons that you know we could certainly get into. Yeah. But I think it is a useful category of analysis. But we have to separate between the rhetorical level of the discourse and the empirical analytical level. I will just point out, and I, I make this argument often, that when Trump appeared on the scene, many people on the extreme right who had long been alienated from the Republican Party uh, and felt that it was just part of a, a hopelessly corrupt duopoly controlled in many cases by the Jews, thought this guy is kind of speaking our language for the first time and got very excited. Uh, so obviously I would trust them to understand their own politics and say, well, this is the sort of figure, the sort of rhetoric, the sort of politics being practiced that we understood. So that's kind of a genetic or genealogical side of the argument that I would make is that there are people who self-consciously consider themselves fascist Nazis who recognize in Trump, if not the perfect avatar of their kind of politics, at least something that was approximate and, and opened the gate. Then there's a structural side of it, which is what does Trump's movement look like in terms of uh, society and politics? Um, Trump's movement, like fascist movements, is not purely born of the conservative right. It's something that attacks the conservative right as insufficiently radical, unable to meet the, the, the problems of the day, and then, in the process of coming to power, uh, kind of forms an amalgamation with, with conservative elites, uh, cows them, browbeats them, threatens them. I mean, uh, Gustav Mokar was killed during the, his, his attempts to appease the Nazis did not work. He was killed during the, 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 the Night of the Long Knives. So the relationship between this, this populist movement, this, this movement, whatever you want to call it, and the existing conservative elites is one of, uh, of sometimes threat and menace and sometimes alliance. So this structural aspect of Trump's attack on the US political system and combined with the recognition, I believe, that people who have long been waiting for this kind of politics just makes a very persuasive argument. And yes, of course, there is a political dimension to this. It's very difficult to, I mean, some people have the opinion that there is nothing that no assessment of the world that doesn't have a political dimension. But I think you can approach these things in somewhat objective terms and say, there is something different going on here. There are, there are signs and markers we can point to that his politics are in the, in the mind of its own practitioners and, in, and people who observe it, a break with certain traditions of the American right. Or it's, it's, a, it's a return to other traditions of the American right. Yeah, and it, it raises questions of why, say, the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and other types gravitated to Trump and saw him as their savior, Richard Spencer included, and then yeah. Richard Spencer breaks with Trump, and now David Duke endorses Jill Stein because Trump is in the pocket of the Jews, yeah. and Nick Fuentes thinks he's not radical enough, and so if the real Nazis are leaving Trump, does that say anything about him being more moderate? I don't think so, because, but it's the same thing that happened in the 1960s when you know, the Willis Cardos of the world and the William Luther Pierce's, they leave George Wallace's movement, they leave the Birchers because they're not radical enough and they become real neo-Nazis. Well, I'm not saying that should no, make no, those other people better, but. And in, in also, the other thing that, that people misunderstand about historic fascist movements is that they're not monoliths. They have internal politics as well. Mussolini dealt with the rest of kind of left of his party, which was looking for a, a social revolution um, was often more anti-Semitic than Mussolini personally, and was annoyed with his moderation and his normalization of the fascist party, and pushed him uh, in a dictatorial direction. Uh, Hitler had his own, you know, rest of sections of the party, which he ultimately took care of by killing them all. Um, but yeah, fascist movements are not monolithic. There are factions. There are different tendencies within them. They're pluralist in a weird way. Um, and I think that's important when you look at a political movement, when we're, or when we were just looking at this, you know, I think by modern lights, 
pretty much everybody in the photos we were looking at, you know, Ludendorff, von Karr, Hitler, we would not hesitate to call fascist, even though at the time Hitler was the one who was maybe identified as fascist. The others is kind of just, you know, monarch monarchist reactionaries and so on mm. and so forth. But, you know, there's a broader radical right. Um, and who and that is being shaped by the most radical part of that always. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in this whole discussion, um, you've talked about a bunch of different movements over a span of 100 years um, that are all sort of anti-democratic, anti-majoritarian, could possibly be described as populist in some sense. Um, but uh, one thing most of them share is anti-Semitism as kind of an animating uh, ideology. Um, and I, I wonder if you can, John, I'll just start with you. Sure. Um, why is that and what sort of continuities can you tease out between all these movements in the way that anti-Semitism functions within them? Well, the interesting thing about anti-Semitism as it emerges as an ideology in the late 19th century. I mean, to separate it just from Jew hatred, which is, we all know has existed for a very long time. But the modern ideology of anti-Semitism was always a little bit fascist. It always envisioned a, a kind of populist, anti-democratic uh, order that took things from socialism, but took things also from reactionary modernism. I mean, when anti-Semitism kind of bursts into the scene during the Dreyfus Affair, you have articulations of a politics and are looking for kind of a Caesar, a strong leader. Um, so you have, anti-Semitism is not just, okay, uh, a hatred of the Jews or a targeting of the Jews. It's the identification of the Jews with many other features of modern society, including capitalism, finance, and democracy especially, um, liberal democracy especially. So the first anti-Semitic parties often, or also called, there's not a direct genealogy, but often called themselves National Socialists. Um, and they attacked Jews as an alien force, and they imagined a national community, uh, a more integral national community that removed, you know, this, 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 uh, this alien force, which they identified closely with liberal democracy, the modern economy, and then socialism. But particularly, interestingly enough, the forms of socialism that kind of moderated and became, well, eventually they associated with Bolshevism too and revolutionism, but a lot of times with a, a particular hatred of moderate socialism that, that, that kind of worked its way into the parliamentary system. So there's always a strong, in anti-Semitism as a political ideology, a strong anti-parliamentary, strong anti-democratic uh, thrust because it viewed those institutions as being hopelessly Jewish. Um, because Jews were actually associated with them, but part of just the way they dealt with social conflict um, through debate, discussion, trade, so on and so forth, these were felt to be insidious, lower forms, unworthy of a society of warriors and producers. So that's a, a, an important thing to remember. Not every fascist movement um, included anti-Semitism at its beginning. Mussolini, famously, not particularly anti-Semitic, had many Jewish friends and lovers, uh, and there were Jewish members of and sympathizers of the fascist movement. Now, Italian fascism becomes anti-Semitic, partly because of the, the need to, foreign policy need to placate Hitler and get close to him, but I think also partly because there is something especially useful about the creation of this internal enemy in fascist politics. And this is a particularly uh, powerful one in people's imaginations. And the amount of propaganda that can be created is extremely, uh, it becomes extremely useful. I can't remember who it was, it, if it was Charles Marat or one of the, a, a prominent French proto fascist, oh no, uh, or maybe it was Barre, said, if I didn't believe in anti Semitism, I would just <clears throat> do it because it's so useful. It's such an incredibly powerful tool for our movement. And this is one of the big anti dreyfus arts. Yeah. So, Gav, I want to get your take on why mm -hmm. that internal enemy is so useful for a fascist politics. Um, but I just want to remind everyone that if you had questions that you wrote down in your note card, um, 
my colleagues Stephanie and Zachary will come collect them um, and we'll, we'll get to them shortly. Um, yeah, I want to pick up on what John was saying. I think I totally agree. One, one way of thinking about anti-Semitism is not in terms of the actual ideas, although what you just laid out in terms of core anti-Semitic ideas are totally true, um, but what's the social function of anti-Semitism? What's its political function? Uh, in that regard, I would just sort of slightly amend what you said when you said that um, anti-Semitism is always fascist yeah. to say that it's also, and it can be communist, which is to say anti-Semitism is always anti-liberal. Yeah. And that you could have right-wingers you know, getting uh, momentum for their movement by hammering the Jews. You can have left-wingers doing it too. I need not point out that you know, uh, Stalin had his, his share and certainly the post-war Soviet Union had its share of demonizing Jews for all kinds of reasons. Um, so uh, what is the theory that I like to employ um, in terms of thinking about anti-Semitism? Um, one of the better books that came out in the last 15 odd years on the subject of the Holocaust was by Peter Longerich, uh, who's a German historian, book simply called Holocaust, and he focuses, um, and he actually uses a term that was popular among a lot of German sociologists called negative integration, which basically makes the case in more highfalutin terms that you were saying that if you want to create um, a kind of political sense of unity among many disparate elements, and of course, the Nazis were very, you know, as Juan Lintz said, it was a late, the Nazis were a latecomer, as was fascism in general, on the Western political uh, scene and stage. So they had to take supporters wherever they could get them, among the lower middle class, among university students, the de classe, you know, some aristocrats and so forth. And you can't really get those people onto the same stage with each other if you're talking about economic policies. You can, however, say to them, you know what, we all hate the Jews together, and we'll integrate ourselves into a movement by focusing on another. Um, there's another concept that has been floated recently um, by a scholar at George Washington University and Lorenzo Bedino. Uh, he refers to intersectional anti-Semitism uh, to point out how, for example, today people, um, you know, it's the famous three colors, red, brown, and green. You've got, you know, far, far left-wing um, anti-Semites certain, among certain progressive circles. You've got the brown Richard Spencer and Nick Fuentes types, and then you've got Islamic jihadis who all seem to come together, and you see this on social media all the time, and figures like Jackson Hinkle, and there's a long list of them, um, who make strange bedfellows with one another. Why? Because they can condemn Jews for different reasons. So when David Duke, for example, says he's opposed to the Israeli genocide in Gaza, it's because he says, we white people are being genocided here at home. And we could say whether that's a bad, we could argue whether is that a bad faith comparison or claim or a good faith one, but there are pl places where, whether we call it intersectional, needs come together or negative integration as it were. Yeah. And I think with MAGAism in general, you've got rich Republican people who want tax cuts and you've got poor white racists who want to come together and integrate based on demonizing umpteen groups. I just want to point that that, that strange synthesis of, of the far left, uh, the far right, and perhaps religious conservatives, or uh, the religious right, is kind of intrinsically what fascist movements accomplished which is that you had people who were formerly, of, especially in Italy, formerly of the left, like Mussolini, uh, found themselves in alliance with you know, very conservative members of the big bourgeoisie. Um, and this also happened in France, where you had members of the form, uh, uh, former socialists who found themselves in alliance with, with, with Catholic reactionaries. And yeah, it, what often functioned as the epoxy of those groups was anti-Semitism. Um, it was something that they could agree on. Uh, mm -hmm. And had different approaches to it. Also, it's a it's a kind of um, it's a prism or it's something that appears different from different angles. For some people, uh, the Jews are the killers of Christ. Uh, this is kind of gets an old Catholic reactionary stream into your politics. For others uh, who come from you know the the socialist left, they're 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 embodiment of capitalism. So yeah, they they function to bring together um, several political movements together, which. All fascist and Nazi parties, are, I mean, Nazis, it's in the name, they're National Socialists, um, are these kind of strange um, amalgamation syntheses. And yeah, you see that happening a lot, where there's uh, strange bedfellows of unholy alliances of, of, of extreme left and extreme right. I mean, one reason why I think it's important for American Jews circa 2024 to be aware of this neither left nor right dynamic is that there's yeah. a tendency among Jewish liberals or Jewish conservatives to say it's only the other side, the anti-Semites, that are the threat. 
And we really do have to walk and chew gum at the same time and be aware of threats coming from both wings. Yeah. Because in my circle of acquaintances and friends, you know, I hear both, uh, both claims that Harris is terrible for the Jews and Trump is terrible for the Jews. And you know, we can pick and choose your reasons to be nervous, but historically, anti-Semitism has come from both wings of the spectrum, so we can't really bracket off only one as the one to worry about, and the others we'll just apologize for. I think we could take some questions from the audience. This is Stephanie Addis, Programs and Communications Manager at Leo Beck Institute. Hi, everybody, and thank you, John and Gav and David, for that great conversation. Um, we have a lot of great questions, so we'll see how many we get through. Um, the first one that we're going to start with is, in regards to family separation policy, 2017 to 2020, isn't fascism already here in America directed against easily recognized minorities? I mean, I'll take two, two quick thoughts. Um, uh, AOC famously led a lot of um, activists to the southern border and said that what was happening with family separation and detention was equivalent to concentration camps. It caused a huge hue and cry. The US Holocaust Memorial Museum got involved. It raised exactly this question of what are appropriate historical analogies and what are inappropriate ones. Um, so that's an ongoing discussion. I will just say, and John, you and I were talking about this on Zoom a little while ago, that under Dwight Eisenhower, under the unfortunately named Operation Wetback, more than a million um, Mexican south of the border Latino workers were expelled um, from the United States. And unless we call ICA fascist, I think we can say that some of these, fap, you know, some of these family separation or immigration policies have long been a part of American history without needing to be called fascist, in which case, maybe the label doesn't matter so much and we can just see reactionary phases in our country's existence. I think as the presentation pointed out, it's important to realize that, you know, the extreme right can have an effect on politics without being explicitly in power or it can only a faction of the ruling group. Um, and it will try to make its, its policies as, as hard line as possible. So I think it's important to think about politics in terms of coalitions and processes and not just, well, they're either in power or they're not. They're always exercising power as part of a coalition or as part of the opposition. Um, so yeah, I think there are arguments to be made that are not necessarily only rhetorical, that there are disturbing parts of American policy. Uh, but you know, uh, in Europe, you have examples of, of countries, I mean, many people make the argument, which I think is quite persuasive that the colonialism and imperialism of European states uh, perfected a lot of the techniques of, of fascist governments, which then returned to the metropole. Um, they were doing some of the same things already. So I think that that's another way of looking at it. Thank you so much. Um, kind of a related note, what would you say are the similarities and differences between a version of American fascism and Italian fascism, especially since the word fascism was coined by Mussolini in 1919. I mean, there's a million anecdotes that are mostly misattributed to people like Sinclair Lewis or Huey Long that when American fascism comes, it won't be you know, with jack boots and armbands, it'll be with apple pie and the Star Spangled Banner. And again, the, the idea is that um, all fascist movements had local coloring and indigenous characteristics. Um, and so there is something to be said for the claim that if we were to ever have fascism, it would be a movement that denies its fascism and that it claims it's for freedom. So um, can we spot it? Um, you know, I think the paradigmatic question that a lot of historians have been spending the last 40, 50 years discussing in, in European studies is, were the Nazis themselves fascist? Because if you take as a sine qua non of national socialism, the centrality of anti-Semitism, and of course the Holocaust is one of its chief byproducts, we know that Italian fascism did not have any anti-Semitic, as John said, element to it for more than half of its existence, and then what it embraced was relatively opportunistic, whereas at the same time the Romanian fascists and the Hungarian fascists were brutally anti-Semitic, um, depends on how big a Jewish population you have in your country and whether they need to be scapegoated for the sake of negative integration. Um, so they're not gonna always be carbon you know, copies of each other. 
So what an American fascism would look like? I don't think well, it would imitate Italy. No, probably not. I mean, the most, I mean, the Klan is arguably in a, the closest thing we've had to an American fascist movement, which incorporated both, you know, racial violence and terror, but also, you know, looked very much for all intents and purposes like any other American civic organization that did charitable works and had clam bakes and apple pie things and so on and so forth. They, and this is, I think, important to think about is like, you know, there's this thing, this, this myth, arguably, that about American society that comes from uh, uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, that we have all these wonderful civic organizations that prevent us from becoming prey to a, to a dictatorship. But you know, those civic organizations can, be in themselves, uh, have authoritarian politics or, or, or nativist or, or racist politics. Um, I know the debate about whether or not the Nazis are fascist or, or, or really fascist, but I mean, I, I just don't understand that fully. I mean, you know much more about this than I do, but from what I can understand is that these movements recognized parallels to each other very early on. And I was reading in preparation for this, the uh, British Foreign Office which was watching very closely what was going on in, in, in Berlin, I mean, I mean in Munich, and they identified the Nazi movement as a, as a fascist movement on the analogy of Mussolini. Mm -hmm. And I think Hitler personally saw Mussolini's seizure of power as a model. So I, I don't, and I understand that there was, there was a huge, there was a radicalism of, of Nazism is fearsome in comparison to Italian fascism, but I believe that, the, that they are part of the same genus of, of political movements. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's a huge debate. A lot of it hinges on the question of how modern or anti-modern these movements were, how much in favor of you know, radical economic uh, populism or industrialization. I mean, the, there's literally decades of scholarship yeah. that have asked the question and made the case, at least, that the Nazis were much more backward looking in what they fantasized about, say, colonizing all of Eastern Europe for an agrarian utopia. They peasants. built a lot of machines. Right, it was, it's, and it's the whole question of like um, modern means for anti-modern ends. Right, right, right. And whereas Mussolini, ruling a country that was very backward economically and industrially, needed to use fascism as a vehicle for modernization. But look, I take your point. Yeah. They're all part of the same species. Um, at the end of the day, um, national socialism, to my mind, I always tell my students, is a more uh, radical, uh, extreme version of uh, fascism. But you know, then we start getting to the narcissism of minor differences. I think in favor of that argument, there were members of Mussolini's party who were much more pro-Nazi than others and viewed that direction as one that they wanted to go in. So. Yep. Thank you so much. Um, this next one is a big one. OK. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> if Trump wins, how fearful as Jews should we be? I think being Jewish means you're always fearful <laughs> about everything. <laughs> Ask my kids. Um, no, I mean, it's, I don't, look, I mean, my, my synagogue in Indiana was firebombed by a white nationalist organization called the Covenant, the Sword, and the Arm of the Lord in 1983. And um, Kathleen Ballou talks about that organization in her book, Bring the War Home, um, or Bringing the War Home. Uh, I grew up always very mindful of the fact that being Jewish in the Midwest was not a um, thing you could feel comfortable about. Um, you know, that was an extreme example of being the um, target of, of a hate crime. Um, you know, we rebuilt our synagogue. We had services in our Lutheran church right next door to us. It was ultimately a, do I call it redemptive or positive experience? No, I'd rather not have gone through that. Um, but from my perspective, um, anti-Semitism, my dad's a Holocaust historian, scholar, so maybe that also explains some of my um, unsurprise at what's been going on. So yes. We should be afraid, but we should always be vigilant. I'm not saying we should be packed, you know, sitting on packed suitcases as German Jews, uh, you know, always, always said after 1945. But um, I think it would be irresponsible to be complacent about um, being Jewish anywhere because of the sweep of Jewish history. I think that certain taboos have broken about political rhetoric, and also things are being forgotten. Uh, whether or not the Jews are explicitly named. Um, as the enemy in a lot of this rhetoric, it's not quite there. In some places it is. But you had Elon Musk going on stage the other day and talking about puppet mass, globalist puppet masters being behind politics. So, and I think that people rightly are alarmed about that. Um, I think that there is also, Trump is just 
such a completely irresponsible person. I think it, I don't know, I don't think he's, I mean, he has Jewish relatives, but I think if you sat down with Trump and explained the protocols of the elders of Zion to him, he would maybe for about three minutes believe in it, and he would absolutely go out on stage and repeat some of it. Um, so I think that there's just a total irresponsibility about the kind of rhetoric that's permitted in the public sphere now. Mm -hmm. A lot of that abuts and often spills the bounds of anti-Semitism. Uh, I believe that Trump believes that Jews, not really American, he always brings up Israel as the context of talking about Jews, not, you know, he's like, and also doing business. You know, he, he loves to just bring up, you know, pretty nasty stereotypes. He's like, I know you guys like money in Israel, and that's really what you care about. Um, so I think that there, is, there have been a lot of taboos that have been broken recently. There's been taboos that have been broken on the left. I, I must admit it as much as it pains me to, about uh, of what can be said. Um, and the memory of the war and the Holocaust is fading. It's not the, the defining issue of people's lives. I don't think kids are, know that much about it, and the information they get is often terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and tendentious and, and misleading and incomplete. So I don't think you have to panic right now, but I do think there's a lot of work to do in terms of sort of, from my perspective, the way what I, what I view as my work or practice of, of politics and writing is like, yeah, you know, anti-fascism is an old tradition and one that is rooted to a specific time. But it has to be kept going. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's just one thing I keep in mind. Yeah, and it raises the reality that being 2% of the population of the country, we can't exist without allies. And the course of 20th century American history certainly shows that the allies that Jews have gotten have come more from one wing of the spectrum than another, and that it's really important to maintain relations. But obviously, the you know, Israel-Palestine conflict has complicated that uh, that alliance building and that alliance maintenance process for some time, and uh, you know everyone's competing for everyone's vote in other ways, and um, yeah, tough time. Thank you, thank you. I think we have time for one more. Yeah. Um, okay. The war against the Jews could not have gained so much traction if major institutions had not lived up, lined up to support the Nazis, like the media and universities. Are we seeing a dangerous replay of those events today? I mean, I'll say just quickly, um, major conservative elites have always been in cahoots with more radical fascists, thinking that they can control them. And certainly the case of Nazi, Nazi Germany shows that the joke was on them in the end, to the detriment of countless millions of people. Um, so the hubris of the elites who think that they can survive and their wealth and assets can survive putting um, the real radicals in charge. I think that's certainly a mistaken belief, but um, the idea of enabling um, has certainly been, as John, you were already indicating, um, fascists don't get into power by themselves. They get brought in through a midwife. Not to gender that too much. Yeah. Uh, I think... I mean, Jews are much bigger part of the population, I think, way more well integrated in the United States today than they were in Germany. And I think anti-Semitism as a political tradition was not just how, I mean, there, there's, a, there's a thought, I forget um, which historian or figure said this, but, but if, the, if the, the DMVP became, came into power and not the NSDAP, maybe the Nuremberg Laws, but not the Holocaust. So, you know, anti-Semitism was a broadly shared ideology among a lot of German parties and a lot of German people. Um, and it was a deep part of the culture, as many cultural historians have pointed out, a part of this Volkish culture that had inculcated, you know, a certain ideal of what it meant to be German, a certain ideal of what it meant to be a man. Um, there was a lot of groundwork put in place about uh, that that made the country primed for for, for anti-Semitism. It doesn't happen overnight. There's a lot of work. Um, I do believe when you see the spread of irresponsible conspiracy theories, um, this is the beginnings, perhaps, of that type of ideological work, which is why you have to be sensitive to it and attack it uh, and point out what it is, in fact. 
But you know, it should be kept in mind that um, as we were just seeing, the political culture of Germany was highly reactionary and very anti-Semitic, and it wasn't just the Nazis. They just happened to be the most radical, and they won out through you know political maneuvering and their 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 uh, you know the, and good luck to a certain degree. So. Mm -hmm. Um, it's difficult to say. I just think there are definitely things that seem unhealthy, uh, tendencies in our politics that seem unhealthy, and tendencies in culture that seem unhealthy, and they should be criticized and uh, called out and identified. And a historical perspective never hurts. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. kudos to LBI, <laughs> kudos to the Center for Jewish History, kudos to scholars John like yourself who are bringing the 90s back into sharp focus. And, <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. John, thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs>